Okay, uh, Terry, are you going to start? You are recording. Great. Okay. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for attending. It is my pleasure. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Williams, a professor of pediatrics, uh, and it's my pl pleasure to um, introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ashley Hill. Uh, Dr. Hill uh, did her undergraduate degree at Spelman College in Georgia, uh, where she earned her BS in biology, and uh, then earned a master's of public health uh, at Georgia Southern University. She stayed with the Southern trend and completed her doctorate uh, of public health in epidemiology at Texas A&M, but then she wised up and came to Pittsburgh uh, to do a postdoctoral fellowship uh, focusing on adolescent research in communities. I'll come back to that in a second with Dr. Miller. Uh, that was an NIH-supported postdoctoral fellowship. And then we were lucky enough to keep her, and she was appointed as an assistant professor in uh, the Department of Epidemiology in the Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. Uh, in 2021. Dr. Hill, uh, her research really throughout her training and career have been in the areas of both, you know, inequities in health uh, and access to health, and especially areas of relevant to adolescent health. One area that's very relevant to adolescent health is sexually transmitted infections. So she's kind of worked in these areas um, and has been very, very well published in these areas with a, a number of first author and senior author publications in leading journals in this field, uh, Journal of Adolescent Health, uh, Maternal and Adolescent Health, um, and others. She's been invited pre to present her research in a number of uh, intramural and extramural uh, uh, institutions. Uh, she's been well funded by the NIH, and some intramural funding, and uh, she's won a number of honors and awards for her research. And this is near to dear, near and dear to my heart. I think one of the most important things we do in academia is training the next generation. And even as fairly young faculty, she's been very engaged with helping mentor and directly mentoring graduate students, uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, and I, I love seeing that kind of activity. And so, uh, you know, what Dr. Hill is going to tell us about today is kind of bringing her research interests together. Uh, and uh, she's going to talk about equitable, equitable approaches for optimal adolescent sexual and reproductive health. Uh, Dr. Hill, welcome. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Williams, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today. Um, as a, a former postdoc, I obviously have to say I've had the opportunity to attend um, this seminar maybe once or twice. We were, our offices were in Oakland, and so it was a little bit of a hike to get to Lawrenceville, but um, it was a great opportunity, I think, to really hear about some of the work happening um, in pediatrics uh, and across both the university and at the hospital and to really be able to have interactions with you all. And so um, being a postdoc in adolescent medicine, I think really was that great opportunity to, to kind of broaden the scope of the work that I was interested in to really have some connections to um, community-based work and to really understand um, what was happening, I think, in our community around this topic. Um, and then also, you know, to be able to just discuss the ways that we can really better uh, create systems that allow our adolescents and young people to access sexual and reproductive health services um, in the best possible way. So I'm going to just share with you a little bit of uh, the work that I have done, um, some background around um, sexual and reproductive health uh, morbidity, and just thinking about the ways that we can um, really think about frameworks and how we can formulate our strategies um, and studies to really address and highlight some of uh, the disparities, but also really address those disparities in meaningful ways. Uh, so I do uh, don't have any conflicts of interest, but I do have uh, some funding to uh, disclose. And I want to also acknowledge and recognize uh, both Dr. Miller um, in um, the Center for Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine um, as the PI for several studies, including my postdoc. Um, 
but some uh, of the data that I'll present today came from uh, some of the work that she's been doing um, in our community locally. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge um, Dr. Natasha DeGena, who is a faculty in psychiatry who has a longitudinal study that I've also been working with. Uh, so a little bit about me, obviously I am from Georgia in the South, so I will say that this weather recently has been a whole new world for me, um, so please send positive thoughts. Um, I, but I am a, a newly appointed faculty um, in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, I was mentioning earlier that Pitt Public Health is going to be dropping the graduate schools very soon um, because we'll be welcoming uh, a very large number of undergraduates into our, our Bachelors of Public Health program. So um, that was an initiative that um, our new dean, um, Dean Lickfield, was really excited to be able to um, push forward. And so we'll be looking forward to um, welcoming some really bright uh, undergraduates uh, to pursue careers in, in education and public health. Um, my primary research area is really around reproductive epidemiology, and that just means that I focus on um, looking at the disease, uh, distributions of diseases and morbidity and mortality around um, reproductive health uh, um, sort of inequities. And so I've, I've primarily focused on, on the impacts of systems and structures that really uh, drive some of the um, inequity and disparities in um, STD rates. Um, and I've also really started to try and think about how we can formulate strategies um, to improve and uplift um, our disparate populations, but really move them towards having um, more equitable experiences. I also like to highlight that I have had some um, field experience, and so I've uh, had several opportunities um, prior to pursuing my uh, doctoral studies to work in um, infectious disease responses through local health departments um, with both Ebola and Zika virus, and then also um, currently with COVID-19, both locally um, and supporting some uh, response, effort in, in response efforts in the state of Georgia. Um, but my day-to-day -day task in those two years that I was um, doing my field experience was really around um, HIV prevention and control. Uh, and so I think that that really gives me um, a unique perspective to thinking about the research and contextualizing how we develop interventions uh, to think about how they can be most effective and how they can really be um, helpful for the populations that we're trying to serve. So I wanted to show you some pictures. I feel like, you know, we get to see uh, bar charts a lot, but you don't really get to see pictures. Lots of sunshine. This is South Florida. Um, so this was me at a, a, a condom distribution activity on the beach. So we're, you know, sending beach vibes for today, even though it's a little cold. <laughs> Uh, so again, I'm just going to kind of talk to you a little bit about STDs, um, what those rates look like and why they're important. Um, talk to you a little bit about the disparities, some of the frameworks that I have found um, can be really effective at thinking about how to promote equity in sexual and reproductive health and how I've applied those frameworks uh, in some of my work. So broadly, sexually transmitted infections are um, commonly reported um, bacterial or viral pathogens that are transmitted sexually. So that's through vaginal, anal or oral sex. Um, we do have several commonly reported STIs, and so that just means that the Centers for Disease Control requires local and state health departments to send those case reports um, when laboratory confirmed infections have been detected. Uh, and so we currently track information on herpes, simplex virus, um, on human papillomavirus, on chlamydia, on gonorrhea, and syphilis, on HIV, and on um, trichomonas. And so one thing that we've seen with our most recent um, STD surveillance reports is that uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis still uh, tend to be um, our most uh, prevalent and commonly reported um, sexual pathogens. Um, however, we do know that there is a, a large proportion of human papillomavirus that circulates within adult populations as well as herpes simplex virus. And we do have uh, some vaccinations, obviously, for HPV, um, but we still are uh, a little bit behind the eight ball with herpes um, and really thinking about how to quantify and really capture um, trichomonas as well. Uh, so for the reporting, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about chlamydia. It's one of the most commonly reported uh, sexually transmitted infections. And as you can see, here on the graph, uh, we have the age distribution and just distribution across gender. Uh, primarily, our, our individuals who are reporting the highest rates of chlamydia are young women age 15 to uh, 24. And so seeing these rates is kind of what sparks a little bit more um, interest for me in trying to understand why the uh, prevalence is so high in our young adult female population um, and what we can do about that. 
So we dig, dig a little bit deeper um, into looking at what the composition of chlamydia uh, positivity looks like by race ethnicity. Um, and then this graph is also displaying um, the geographic distribution of these case reports. And so what you'll see here is that primarily um, we have the highest reported prevalence amongst um, black individuals uh, in the Northeast that's denoted by the darker green bar. Um, and in the most recent surveillance reports, we see that um, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders have made up a, another significant proportion um, of the uh, chlamydia positivity, particularly in the Midwest, which is denoted by uh, the blue bar. And so, again, it's really important to understand why or, or to think about what um, the composition of the prevalence is and also thinking about asking the question of why. Why are we seeing uh, the uh, constellation of these infections in certain populations and what can we do uh, to really equal that out and also really reduce that across um, all groups. And then locally, I wanted to make sure that I presented some local um, data. Locally, we see the same uh, sort of pattern in chlamydial infections within Allegheny County. So our uh, primary groups that are affected uh, continue to make up uh, the female at 15 to 24 age group. Um, and we see additionally with the racial composition that black um, and individuals of unknown race, um, particular women, um, make up the largest proportion of uh, the new chlamydial diagnosis um, within Allegheny County. And so we see that our national rates are really mirrored here locally as well. One other thing that I thought was really interesting to highlight um, and something that we don't have a ton of information on yet, but uh, is starting to really um, become collected. And we'll also start to see this with the STD surveillance reports that um, come out over the next couple of years uh, with the data lag, but to see what happened over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic with interruptions in clinical services. Uh, what several studies have found that there were um, pretty significant increases in gonococcal infections in adolescents and young adults age 16 to 24 uh, during the pandemic. We also saw increases in um, syphilis, particularly uh, through universal screenings at um, health departments. Uh, which is where a majority of people were receiving their sexually transmitted infection screening services uh, during the pandemic. Um, and we also saw that there were some um, indications of higher chlamydial infections in young women higher than uh, pre-pandemic times. Um, and particularly, we saw that the disparities continue to persist in uh, Black females. And so this uh, was was really important to think about, and I think is it is going to continue to be important to think about when we think through um, accessing services and how to make services um, more equitable across all populations. Um, and so this uh, table is just showing uh, the prevalence of services that were report reported um, by primary care physicians uh, that were. Uh, that were surveyed to ask them about their pre-pandemic and during the pandemic uh, services offered around uh, reproductive and sexual health. And so I highlighted here the clinic-based STI screenings, and you'll see here that uh, just before the pandemic, and so this was looking at April 2019 to December 2019, uh, these providers reported that about 75% of their services offered were clinic-based ba STI testing. Um, but what you'll see during the uh, pandemic, and they have it uh, separated by any disruption um, um, any of their services being continued since the pandemic began um, and then having any sort of limited services. But you'll see that there was a pretty uh, significant decline in the clinic based, based STI screening. And so that's also mirrored in some of the uh, data and the reporting that we'll, we'll start to see from um, 2020 and early 2021 um, that comes from CDC. There were lots of interruptions in services. There were pretty uh, stark declines in um, in testing overall and screening broadly, but also positivity. And so we know um, that we can't attribute that to actual prevention, but really that a lot of people were uh, unable to reach services. And so we really are going to have to think about what that means for um, the upcoming years and really any future interruptions when it comes to uh, climate and global, uh, global c catastrophes. So in addition to um, these these uh, rates, what we also recognize, and particularly for uh, 
female identifying individuals and those who are um, childbearing, it's really important to think about what the impacts and implications of sexually transmitted infections are, particularly in this 15 to 25 year old age group amongst a population that is of reproductive age. Uh, and so this figure is demonstrating the rates of chlamydia um, amongst pregnant women by maternal race and ethnicity um, from 2018. And so you'll see that the majority of cases of um, chlamydial infections in pregnant women were reported from non-Hispanic Black and Hispanic young women. Um, and so again, it's really important to think about what the context of um, this means. And so chlamydia during pregnancy can have pretty significant implications for pregnancy outcomes. It's been related to uh, preterm birth and preeclampsia. Um, it can also, if uh, transmitted from the mother to the infant, can cause um, ocular infections and can cause many other things that would really complicate uh, the early first few days and early childhood of the of the infant. And so really prevention um, during this period is extremely important and necessary. So some of the work that I did previously and in, in sort of understanding the impacts of um, the potential impacts, excuse me, of, of chlamydia during pregnancy was looking at the um, age distribution and differences between uh, preterm birth and or the association of chlamydia during pregnancy um, with preterm birth or preeclampsia. Pre and so what we identified as denoted by the orange bars uh, is that younger women um, under the age of 25 who had chlamydia during their pregnancy were at increased risk of delivering preterm um, and they were also at increased risk of um, having a preeclampsia, being diagnosed with preeclampsia during their pregnancy. And we saw that this effect while um, there was some evidence of it in our unadjusted models. Uh, in our fully adjusted models, the effect did not remain um, for older women. And so really, again, we're trying to demonstrate that there is a relationship between these infections during pregnancy and some of the outcomes that we really are trying to avoid um, and really thinking about the best possible ways for intervention for um, these particular groups. Um, we've also seen rises in the reported cases of congenital syphilis. So congenital syphilis, again, is a syphilis transmitted from mother to child um, during uh, the birth um, or during pregnancy. And so these increases in, in this data comes from CDC, but the the uh, prevention of congenital syphilis is one of the uh, one of a primary objectives with the March of Dimes. And so we've really seen an uptick over the past few years of congenital syphilis cases when we had um, almost really eradicated the congenital syphilis. And so, it, again, these are kind of just metrics to be able to demonstrate the fact that there is a problem and we've got to figure out better ways to really address it. Uh, and so oftentimes our sexually transmitted infection prevention has focused primarily on the individual um, level risk factors. So thinking about a person changing their behaviors or figuring out how they can do something different individually to really uh, impact or improve the risk of these particular outcomes. Well, what we've seen over the over the course and trajectory, I would say, of prevention um, in sexual health broadly is that individual uh, modifications oftentimes do have some effectiveness, but it is quite limited and oftentimes is limited by the population level risk factors or the social level sub social level risk factors or um, the environmental risk factors that often play a much more significant role than the individuals able to um, change themselves. And so we've off, we've started to really think about how to shift our perspective um, in um, understanding and really finding the most appropriate prevention strategies from focusing on the individual to really moving towards thinking about these population level risk factors, thinking about environmental and social factors that can really influence um, these outcomes and these disparities. And so a lot of my work is situated here in the social context thinking about um, experiences of in exposure to violence, thinking about discrimination, um, and even thinking about the working environment and living conditions that can really influence um, these specific outcomes. And so the question that I started to ask myself really was why are there disparities? Uh, and what I started to uncover, particularly during my postdoc time, was that there's a significant correlation between experiences of violence and some of these sexual uh, in, in, uh, reproductive health outcomes, but that oftentimes they're directly influenced by inequitable systems that we um, have established just in society that really allow for and contribute to experiences of discrimination, oppression, um, that can manifest in neighborhood composition um, and that can really be contextualized um, by some of our structural disparities. And some 
previous uh, investigations into these uh, kind of ideas have been um, established specifically within sexual health. And so this um, is a snapshot of a report from uh, the Sexual Health Journal, which really looked at um, police killings of uh, black individuals and, and the correlation between rates of sexually transmitted infections. And so what they found was that in metropolitan statistical areas that had a large number um, of police killings, that there was an increased rates of sexually transmitted infections, particularly um, gonorrhea and chlamydia uh, across the United States. And so I think that this was really the first time that um, any group had really tried to make the connection between some of these more social um, social experiences that were directly related to a hard outcome like sexually transmitted infections. We've also seen, uh, particularly with Cynthia Prather and her colleagues, that there has been a, a relatively long history of reproductive inequity um, in Black and Indigenous women in the United States. Uh, and so these authors really wanted to think about and, and highlight the historical narratives of these experiences and how they can't be left out of the equation when we're discussing how to really address and promote reproductive equity. Uh, and so what they did was uh, create this timeline, which I think is really important. And I also have to say, sort of from my own um, interest, I have a, a pretty big interest in history myself. And I think it's really uh, useful to know sort of the historical context of a lot of the things that um, have happened in, in our country as well as in our, our world to, to really uh, understand how to better uh, have a, a more bright and I think uh, optimal future. And so um, Prather and colleagues demonstrated this timeline of racism in the United States and the direct implications on reproductive health. Um, and so you'll see that um, over the course of the U.S. history, there were um, multiple events such as um, sanctioned reproductive violence, uh, such as um, sexual and reproductive mutilation, which we also see um, in international settings currently today. Um, and, and these things continued um, to persist in our society um, unaddressed for um, pretty much the the entirety of our existence as a country. And so all of these things, I think, have to be taken into account when you're working with um, Black and Indigenous and other minority populations. Um, additionally, obviously, a few years ago, uh, well prior to um, my arrival here, uh, there was sort of the uh, conversation around the legacy of Thomas Perrin as the founding dean of Pitt Public Health and sort of his um, contributions to the architect of some uh, very um, kind of visceral U.S. government campaigns and, and legislature through the American plan that really um, criminalized sexually transmitted infections. And so the American plan allowed and really deputized uh, government agencies to uh, imprison um, women primarily who were suspected of or confirmed to have sexually transmitted infections. And this was sort of on the heels of World War I when we had our, a super uh, big syphilis epidemic and really trying to um, prevent uh, soldiers that were returning back home uh, from having um, adverse events from syphilis. Uh, but unfortunately, this, this legislature really targeted um, and unfairly oftentimes imprisoned and detained um, women who were um, just suspected of, of being promiscuous or of, of having a sexually transmitted infection. Uh, and so I think that these things for me especially are extremely important to know the context of things that have happened locally um, in the pursuit of the questions that I have and really trying to understand how to um, think about disparities and highlight the uh, and address the historical context of the things that have happened um, in populations that we're trying to serve. Also, uh, the U.S. obviously has a, a pretty long history of forced sterilizations. Um, and so this graphic is from uh, the Social Justice Lab at the University of Michigan, and they specifically looked at sterilization in North Carolina um, and were able to demonstrate that Black women during uh, 1937 to 1966 were the highest uh, group to be forcibly sterilized um, compared to white, Black, you know, white women, Black men, and white men. Um, and so just, again, really interesting to think about the context of sexual and reproductive health, the services that people um, decide to uh, engage and then also thinking about the generational narratives that are passed along. Um, what are grandparents telling their their children about what they uh, should do or not do or what they should avoid and, and how these things are truly oftentimes anchored and rooted in in real events that have happened. Um, and so really 
I think as a researcher myself, I'm interested in really validating those concerns and in, in those narratives, but then also trying uh, to highlight and uplift the most uh, equitable and the the most effective services to really prevent um, the outcomes that we're trying to avoid. So one thing I think is also really important is thinking about how we move from this context of health disparities to um, thinking about health, health equity. So we get to see a lot of you know, differences. There are differences in cases or differences in outcomes, um, but what do we do to really address that and how can we uh, really stabilize and equalize experiences across the board for everyone? So I think there are a few grounding frameworks um, that are oftentimes uh, cross-disciplinary. So these aren't things that were necessarily uh, originated in public health or anything else. A lot of them are anthropology based or legal. Um, for instance, intersectionality uh, was a, a, a framework that was really proposed by a legal scholar to think about the uh, overlapping um, sort of marginalized identities that multiple groups can have. And so her uh, example was thinking about um, uh, gender minorities or sexual minorities and, and thinking about racial identities and how oftentimes those two identities can overlap and, and a person can be multiple, multi, have a, 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 a multiplicative effect around their marginalization because of those identities. Um, and so I think that that's something that's really important to think about in, in the context of the services that we offer, in the context of the populations that we serve, and how they may be having really difficult experiences um, in their everyday life, and that can kind of of overlap and, and really um, compound to uh, increase the adverse experiences that we're trying to avoid. Uh, another framework that I've um, adopted and really started to think about in my work is this syndemic framework, which really starts to look at social conditions like diseases. So thinking about how poverty can interact with um, the inability to um, have adequate housing or transportation and how all of those things can really compound and uh, allow the enhancement of a disease progression or a specific negative outcome. Uh, and so this uh, framework was proposed by a medical anthropologist, Meryl Singer, um, in, the, in the early 90s and was really thinking about how the interaction of um, the use of uh, illicit drugs, of um, violence, and then also of um, multiple marginalized identities can really have an impact on the uh, HIV um, positivity rate of certain individuals given um, the experiences and exposures that they have uh, just to their social environments. Uh, and so Xiao and colleagues recently um, published this article that was really looking at how there can be mo multiple psychosocial stru stressors um, in an individual's life and then also in their uh, just sort of general biosphere that can really interact with one another to advance both um, infections, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, um, as well as things that can impact their behaviors, uh, such as poor mental health, um, such as malnutrition, um, that could potentially introduce substance use, um, experiences of violence that can introduce um, many other things and really place a person um, in, a, in a very vulnerable state. And so I really like this figure because, again, it sort of names and highlights these things on the outer circle that are very real experiences, um, but that can often go overlooked in the context of trying to understand and create an equitable environment for individuals to have optimal health. So I was really interested in examining syndemics in young women. Um, I think that this is really um, important because thinking about these multiple social conditions can really help us center the most appropriate um, measures, number one. So how do we collect information um, on the populations that we're trying to serve? But then also, how do we really think about tailoring strategies for preventing um, outcomes that are uh, that we'd like to avoid um, to best optimize the health of, of the individuals that we want to target? Uh, and so I did this work prime previously um, looking at syndemics in young women. Um, I used the uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey uh, to examine uh, several social, uh, demographic, um, behavioral, and uh, sexual health outcomes um, within a latent class analysis. And so this table is demonstrating um, and really showing the uh, the probabilities of response in each of these classes and, and the class membership probabilities 
through this mixture modeling approach. But really what the takeaway from uh, this analysis was demonstrating is that um, compared to non-Hispanic white women within this group, and this looking at NHANES from uh, 2011 to 2014, black and Hispanic women who reported relatively lower proportions of each of these indicators oftentimes had a tenfold increase in their odds of sexually transmitted infections. And so really what we want to highlight and sort of draw in is that there's a constellation of issues that often only are addressed individually, um, don't translate into the specific outcome um, that we're trying to negate. And so for this one, it was uh, demonstrating with the constellation of all of these issues, an increased risk of, of sexually transmitted infections. We've also seen um, previous uh, authors, Martinez and colleagues, have demonstrated syndemics in young pregnant women. Um, and while this isn't something that's been done uh, routinely, uh, the evidence of, of a syndemic, um, particularly in pregnancy and in, in young women with pregnant um, who are pregnant, uh, demonstrates more uh, of a need to investigate this. And so uh, Martinez and colleagues looked at a syndemic of substance use, partner violence, and depression. Um, and use the moderator of these young women's um, immigration or, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, nativity. And so uh, they found that as young women were uh, further away from uh, their uh, time in the United States, so if they were born elsewhere um, or were first generation or second generation um, immigrants to the U.S., uh, Im the the individuals who were closest to their native their uh or excuse me had a shorter amount of time um in the united states often had a, a, a less uh severe um constellation of issues um and again referring back to that experiences of violence um substance use um and were able to have more um, optimal and healthy pregnancies. And so th I think the main takeaway here is really thinking about the fact that there are syndemics that can be very unique to specific populations, um, particularly thinking about young pregnant women and how um, being a younger uh, woman experiencing pregnancy can oftentimes be a vulnerable situation, um, particularly because of um, external perceptions or um, mistreatment. Um, and so really thinking about how do we quantify and really understand what are some of the uh, constellation of problems that can really be related to the outcomes, again, that we're trying to avoid. Uh, so I did want to do this um, locally using uh, the Young Moms cohort, um, who the PI for that, again, is Natasha DeGena out of uh, the Department of Psychiatry. And so she recruited participants locally um, when they presented for prenatal care um, at McGee Women's here. Uh, and so we requested their health record information, some biological samples, and they answered survey questions so that we can understand some of their demographics. Um, they were screened for tobacco and cannabis use. The parent study, um, the objectives are to really look at the trajectories of cannabis and tobacco use during pregnancy in this young um, young adult population and, and what the impacts of um, cannabis and tobacco use are on pregnancy um, and on the infant. Uh, so we also measured some experiences of partner violence, we measured stress and depression, um, we measured pregnancy intention, and we asked them a little bit about pregnancy-related symptoms such as nausea, um, and we also got their SGI um, history from the medical record. And so we had a small sample of, of young women, about 61, who were recruited at the time. Uh, right up until the uh, pandemic started. Uh, they were primarily ages 15 to 21. Um, roughly half of them were Black in within their first pregnancy. Uh, about a third of them reported uh, being depressed, and um, you'll see about, uh, roughly 40% of them uh, reported some uh, high stress. 17% uh, reported experiencing partner violence, and we did detect uh, cannabis and tobacco in roughly 50% of the population. Um, also, about 60% of them had previously had an STI diagnosis. So um, this was really interesting, uh, I think, just preliminary data to be able to, to collect. And so we also performed another latent class analysis. And again, we're really interested in looking at the composition and sort of constellation of these variables um, in conjunction to uh, this specific um, sexually transmitted infection outcomes. And so what you'll see 
um, in our first uh, class here, um, our young women were primarily uh, had an unintended pregnancy. Um, they were experiencing some pregnancy related symptoms um, as well as some stress and depression. Um, a lot and primarily most of this first class was depressed. Um, you also see that they were using cannabis and tobacco and also had a history of STI um, in their medical record. Uh, the class two was primarily made of, of young women who were currently enrolled in school. Um, about half of them were working. They were in their first pregnancy. That was not intended. Um, they were experiencing some pregnancy related symptoms and they did um, uh, ex ex distribute or excuse me, dis display some uh, depressive symptoms as well. Um, but this group um, primarily were not using uh, cannabis or tobacco and um, had a, a relatively low proportion of STI in their medical records. And then the third group you'll see, um, again, we're currently working primarily um, unintended pregnancy. All of them were experiencing pregnancy symptoms, um, and then some of them were using cannabis during their pregnancy, um, but they did have a higher proportion of young women who um, had previously had an STI. And so you'll, I, I think the use now application of this uh, mixture modeling approach really allowed us to see what the differences were in the constellation of these uh, particular uh, variables of interest and really I think uh, provided some evidence to suggest that pregnancy related symptoms and pregnancy specific experiences are really related to a uh, syndemic and pregnancy for uh, for young adult women. And so lastly, I think it's also really important for us to think about how we ground um, our experiences, particularly um, experiences that can be racialized um, in the work that we're trying to do. And so um, Ford and, and Aaron, Aaron Bua were able to propose um, this idea of critical race public health praxis, which really thinks about contextualizing race, um, not as a predictor of a specific disease or outcome, but really a an indicator of societal treatment that can in, in then be, um, I think, directly related to some of the specific outcomes that we oftentimes um, incorrectly attribute to an individual's race. And so they use an example of um, looking at environmental characteristics, at population characteristics, um, and behavioral outcomes that they um, were interested in um, achieving, which was HIV uh, screening. And so you'll see that there are several components of the um, environment that is important to consider that um, both include neighborhood characteristics and thinking about income, educational attainment, um, and residential uh, stability. Um, the population characteristics, for example, um, were an example they gave was perceived racism. And so I think one thing that we can start to do um, is really start to collect that information from our, our population. What are some of the experiences of discrimination that they're um, having and how can they be directly related to um, some of the outcomes, again, that we're trying to avoid? Uh, and so we've tried to apply this uh, framework um, to look at the impacts of racism on um, adolescent health and wellness broadly. And again, wanting to sort of um, orient you again to this idea that we really think that there are um, direct relationships between some of these experiences of um, structural inequity. And so thinking about how that can be measured both in our um, neighborhoods and communities and society broadly, and that there's direct and indirect, um, I think, relationships with experiences of violence and some of these sexual health outcomes. Uh, so what we wanted to do was examine uh, two groups, data from two groups. Uh, one was the Manhood 2.0 sample. Um, this is a, a cluster randomized trial of boys age 13 to 19 that was testing the effectiveness of a curriculum um, really designed to promote um, healthy masculinities and, and thinking about gender equity. Um, that was compared to a job skills program and it was implemented here locally. And so this is a, a study that was um, ran by Dr. Elizabeth Miller and, and um, was conducted locally here. And so we were able to collect a lot of this uh, information on discrimination from these boys. Um, and we also took data from Sisterhood 2.0, which was a uh, sister uh, project to uh, Manhood, which was really also looking at um, implementing a, a gender transformative um, a, a program that was really uh, focused on violence prevention, but was really grounded and rooted in, in uh, positive relationships um, and thinking about really uh, promoting gender equity that was adapted from the manhood curriculum. Uh, and so these programs were both implemented um, in Pittsburgh in some of the neighborhood settings. Uh, 
So for the purposes of this analysis, we wanted to include um, measures of, of racism. So we uh, asked the youth about their perceptions of um, racism uh, that they had experienced and using this uh, scale perceptions of racism in children and youth. And then we also asked them about their experiences of violence victimization, um, both sexual violence, victimization and perpetration over the course of their lifetime. Uh, so we worked uh, together to number one, um, identify and confirm the factor structure um, that it was a appropriate uh, in our population for the perceptions of children and, and racism in children and youth. Um, and then we also wanted to look at um, a, a model that examined um, the the relationship between these perceptions of racism um, and experiences of sexual violence victimization. Uh, so the the this slide is kind of primarily reporting some of the the main um, indicators of self-reported discrimination that were um, found in this group. And so you'll see um, we had about 560 boys that responded and about 189 girls, um, and they were all a a roughly 15 years old. Um, but what was really interesting is thinking um, the questions uh, asked specifically because of the color of your skin, language or accent, or because of uh, your culture or country of origin, had you ever experienced any of these things? And so you'll see that uh, roughly 38% of boys and girls reported being treated unfairly by police. Um, about 53% of boys and 62% of girls had a feeling that someone was afraid of them uh, just going around on, on their normal activities. About 53% of boys and 65% of girls had um, reported being called in, in, an insulting name. Uh, and about 56 and 67% of uh, girls and boys discussed uh, or reported that someone had been rude to them again because of, of their uh, skin color, language, accent, culture, um, country of origin. And there were some um, significant differences by gender that we found. So in relationship to these experiences and outcomes of uh, sexual violence victimization in both the manhood and the sisterhood sample, we um, we're able to find a uh, significant relationships between um, those experiences. Uh, and so you'll see there's a roughly threefold increase and a tenfold increase uh, in the girls. And so, you know, really what we saw was that was that the um, higher mean discrimination scores were uh, associated with sexual violence victimization. Um, in both boys and girls, and that this is something that I think we can use to really understand what the experiences of young people are like, both locally and then I think in our in our nation, but really also contextualizing that to be able to determine the effective prevention strategies um, and how we do this work in a meaningful way. So some next steps, um, I was funded on a, a diversity supplement from the um, National Institutes of Minor Minority Health and Health Disparities to really look at the implications and the impacts of racism on sexual health directly. Uh, and so in some of this work, uh, my plans are to qualitatively assess how girls have experienced racism and discrimination and how these experiences could be related to um, their sexual health behaviors, uh, particularly around condom use. I'm also interested in using uh, some survey data to uh, explore some of these concepts as well. So really seeing how we can uh, look at the direct and indirect relationships between um, these societal experiences and some of our sexual health outcomes that we're hoping to avert. Uh, my goal with that is to really think about how we can um, appropriately tailor and 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 use intervention strategies that have had you know some effectiveness at modifying behaviors but really looking at how we can integrate um, challenging some of the inequitable systems really thinking about how we can promote equity within our um, governmental systems within our uh, healthcare systems that allow um, both access and, and, and give some responsibility and agency to our young people um, who are really you know trying to live optimal lives uh, and so the focus groups that um, will be conducted for AIM-1 are going to start relatively soon, so I'm really excited to be able to get those going um, and really be able to uh, use some of this information to really tailor and, and come up with this intervention strategy that we'll test in a randomized trial.
So I um, want to thank, but again, the uh, the study PIs for all of the data um, that I presented today, and also um, Amber Hill, who was a, a MD PhD student here um, at Pitt and worked on uh, several of these projects with me as well. She's now at the University of Michigan, so I'm looking forward to continuing to be able to collaborate with um, students and in all of our um, peers here locally to really think about how we uh, promote equity for um, our young people around their sexual and reproductive health. So I appreciate your time today and I thank you so much and I will uh, I think stop sharing so I can we can see each other. Well, Dr. Oh, Dr. Hill, Hill was terrific. I'll open up in a second for questions, but I, I had a question. One of the early things. Well, one is a comment in a question. Comment is. You know, when you showed the syndemic diagram of like all the different factors, I thought, oh my God, that's just like those horrible biochemistry diagrams. Like it's so complicated. This is why I'm a simple virologist. Few genes. Um, but you know, I, a long time, I was really struck by the data you showed about the rise of STIs, you know, during the pandemic. Uh, I mean, clearly younger people don't cower indoors the way us older people do. Uh, but it, it, it is, um, could that be resolved by a telemedicine kind of approach, you know, you, you I, I think imply that it's due to uh, reduced screening, reduced access to care. So I just wondered, would a solution to that be telemedicine, which is how we try to ad address a lot of other um, access to care issues during the pandemic? Absolutely, I think so. And I think any of the approaches that we took to really make sure that people did not lose um, the consistent access to care, I think could be applied, you know, to our sexual and reproductive health services. We've really seen um, a rise in, you know, apps and electronic uh, delivery mechanisms that allow people to quickly and effectively access things like uh, contraception and um, be able to have these telemedicine visits and be able to kind of usurp uh, some of the, the issues and challenges with, um, our insurance and, and sort of, you know, healthcare system broadly. And I agree totally that being able to engage young people in telemedicine visits earlier on, I think in their pediatric care broadly, would really create an environment and a comfortability to allow them to be able to do that. Um, and I also think could possibly, you know, open up some of the issues around um, confidentiality when it comes to sexual health services for adolescents um, who are kind of still um, in that phase of, of needing a, a parent to be involved and heavily involved in their care care, um, but that may also want some privacy um, when it comes to discussing some of their uh, sexual and reproductive health services um, and needs. And so I think creating a culture and environment that telemedicine is appropriate um, to do these things, I think is, is really going to be one um, effective way to move forward to be able to have some of this equity across the board. Thank you. Other questions? And I will put another plug in for our um, so our, our Department of Epidemiology is seeking a chair. <laughs> we were talking about this a little bit earlier, um, but we're certainly, you know, excited to be able to um, welcome some some new ideas and, and looking for some strong leadership in our department. And so I would be remiss if I did not uh, plug that and ask you all. I, I um, included our uh, announcement in the chat, um, but if you know of anyone or um, are interested yourself, in this position, we're certainly excited to be able to um, welcome a new leadership um, for our department. So wanted to, to say that again as well. Yeah, feel free to share that with people at other institutions that you know. So, uh, you know, another question that I had is, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I, I you highlighted in the aims of your study, you know, building off the manhood and sisterhood 2.0, you know, how can we learn things to intervene? I guess, uh, you know, and this is where the complexity of, of your field, the social sciences to me, sort of really mirrors the complexity of those biochemistry diagrams is that, as you, and you alluded to this yourself, like some of those things are kind of beyond the individual's control, they're beyond our control as researchers, um, so I guess, you know, are you in this research, do you try and find specifically 
things that are sort of actionable, you know, e either by the individual or by, you know, a university partner, whereas, you know, we can't change the local economy or, you know, things like that. Absolutely. And I, I would say this is sort of where um, my my field experience hat kind of comes into play. One thing um, that we often uh, had to do was really triage people's social services. So when you are are discussing some with someone um, uh, that's newly diagnosed with HIV, what are some of the barriers to them being able to um, get into care and to be able to consistently take their medication or to be able to access um, the services and the resources they need. Um, lots of times in, in my work, what I found was that there was lots of housing instability, food instability, um, there were job insecurities, um, and those things often created an environment where their physical care was much lower on the totem pole um, and their prime, excuse me, their priority areas of needs. Um, and, and so being able to connect with uh, our partners who were either, you know, agency partners that could provide um, some of those resources that could offer them um, at least, you know, some uh, security around being able to get meals or to be able to secure housing, um, to be able to um, have some of the things that they were basic necessities um, to get those addressed. And so I think those are some of the ways um, when we're directly working with populations to be able to kind of think about how to triage those needs um, the same way we would, you know, an emergency care setting, really think about what are some of those high priority needs um, that could be addressed that we can collaborate with our community partners to really address, um, get them linked into services, get those warm referrals um, happening, and then really we can start to build a plan to address some of the outcomes um, that we're trying to avert. And I think in that way it can be a little less complex and maybe a little bit more um, collaborative so that we're really working across um, disciplines, across um, agencies to um, highlight those needs and make sure that um, our populations are getting the things Things that that they need. Yeah, I mean the the transportation bit is huge. Like, not s some, but probably not everybody on this call knows that. Gee, why why is adolescent health and the general academic peds clinics? Why why are they still in Oakland? Did we not want them in Lawrenceville? No. The reason is that the the patients, the humans that those two groups care for, uh, are pr predominantly in Oakland and in the surrounding region. And to get to Lawrenceville is like two buses, which might as well be, I mean, I spent many years of my life riding buses and I didn't have a car. Like, I mean, that's an in, insurmountable barrier. And so things that people often take in the healthcare space for granted, you know, and we've seen this with COVID, right? Oh, well, just go to the UPMC South Tide to get tested. Yeah, that, that was not practical for anybody in South Oakland. Absolutely. And I, I agree. I think, you know, a lot of the uh, experiences and the, the the strategies that we've seen come out uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic can be broadly applied, I think, to any kind of social determinants of health research. And so when we're thinking about what people need, how they get what they need, and the information that they're able to have access to, you know, we've, we've seen almost like a, a, an unreal, you know, amount of misinformation and disinformation come out around, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think Kind of applying that to other disciplines you oftentimes can see like it, it sometimes it's really difficult for people to um, process you know what we have come to understand as sort of basic information but also you know the privilege that we have of being able to be in spaces to really be able to sit with that information have discussions conceptualize it um, and be so you know close to it at all times is oftentimes something that you know, a, a lay person may not have the time, the energy, the capacity to really kind of spend the time to do that. Uh, and so I think, you know, the way that we uh, share information, the way that we uh, situate um, the resources that we're hoping to make available that, that we want people to access. Um, and, and I think that's a great example of thinking about where the clinics are placed, how how easily it is for your adolescents to get to them, your your families to be able to get there, you know, how close they are to work or school or, you know, any of these other things are often things we don't think about in, you know, sort of a structural context, but really have a lot to do with whether or not people are going to be able to get what they need. Well, it's job security for you. You have plenty of research to do. Thank you. Uh, okay, it's 12.55. Any other questions from the audience?
Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Hill, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Dr. Hill again, and uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.